Okay, so um, there's quite a lot to get through today. Um, so we're going to have this lecture, and then the practical is going to be two parts. So there's going to be kind of like a little paper exercise, which will then lead on to uh, a kind of a discussion-based exercise, uh, which uh, should make it possibly there should make it possible for you to uh, pass the exam. Um, so feel free to leave at any point, but staying to the end will be your, um, in your advantage, um, I promise. Um, right, so we're going to talk today about some of the uses of uh, radiogenic isotopes in paleoceanography. Okay, so we've been having loads and loads and loads of igneous stuff, loads of high temperature stuff, loads of radioactive stuff, uh, and this is kind of where it actually gets kind of applied to something that's kind of useful uh, to kind of geoscientists kind of that are interested in how the how the earth works um, in the past so this is uh, some uh, these are some shots of a cruise that I was on uh, a couple of years ago where we were using this this is a, called a Caston Cora and that recovers kind of you can see uh, you see this length of mud has been recovered uh, by these, um, these scientists here um, so it's kind of this is the kind of archive that we're going to be talking about mostly today, kind of deep sea sediment cores and what kind of geochemical information we can get out of them. So uh, usually uh, paleo folk, um, kind of people that are interested in paleoclimate, kind of measure some kind of wiggle down down core and try and interpret that in with respect to climate. And quite often, I mean, you can see this is a, a record, a composite record of a number of marine sediment cores using oxygen isotopes. And hopefully you'll remember back to the oxygen isotope lecture, how those work and what those might be telling us about climate, potentially in terms of temperature or the amount of uh, um, ice on, uh, on land. Um, but today, uh, we're not gonna be talking about oxygen isotopes, so we're basically gonna be just using radiogenic isotopes as the vertical axis on our kind of wiggle of proxies through time. Okay, so the ones we're gonna focus in on are strontium isotopes and neodymium isotopes. So you should be fairly familiar with strontium isotopes uh, from Jeff's um, uh, isotopathon um, that he had two weeks ago, maybe. Um, anyway. um, so just to give a quick recap uh, of what um, what we mean by radioactive and radiogenic isotopes. So it's basically, so radio, radio, radioactive is like the isotope, the parent isotope that is, gives off radiation and produces a daughter isotope, which can be thought of as radiogenic, as in it comes from radioactivity. So in this case, we're looking at making use of uh, isotopes that make up the red curve on this, this diagram here. So to recap, strontium, oh, this has got animations on it. So uh, rubidium decays to strontium, uh, with some unfeasibly long half-life. Um, and basically you have the, uh, the strontium-87 comes from rubidium-87, okay? And then we normalize all of our measurements to a stable isotope of strontium, strontium-86. So over time, the strontium-87-86 ratio will change, so will increase through time as the rubidium decays to strontium, making this ratio bigger, okay? And basically what we're doing is that, that the rate at which this, this number here increases, okay, depends on the rate of radioactive decay, okay, which is fairly constant, um, but also the ratio of rubidium to strontium in our sample. So if we've got something with a very, very, um, something down here with a very, very high rubidium to strontium ratio, it will increase its 87, 86 strontium ratio more quickly than something with a low rubidium to strontium ratio. Okay, and that's quite important. Um, so if we look at how stuff has evolved through time, okay, so the, basically the bulk earth has evolved along this blue line, which is basically you know, all of the rubidium in the, the earth is decaying to strontium, so this 87, 86 ratio increases through time. But then at some point in time, in this point, maybe 2.5 billion years ago, we have some events that maybe separates out uh, in our rubidium and strontium into different reservoirs. So uh, if you form continental crust, you should know from the stuff that Jeff's been doing that uh, rubidium is more incompatible in a melt of the mantle. Okay, so if you melt a little bit, of, if you melt a small amount of the mantle, okay, the resulting kind of liquid that goes on to form the continental crust will have a higher rubidium content than what you started with, 
Okay, so that 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 causes the um, the continental crust to have a higher rubidium strontium ratio. So over time, the 87-86 ratio increases faster than the bulk earth. And then what's left behind after you form the continental crust is the depleted mantle, and that increases at a much slower rate because you've essentially you've removed most of the rubidium from the mantle. Okay, so that that does that, that the rubidium that's left still decays and produces uh, 87 strontium, but at a at a lower overall rate. Okay, I should point out that this line is still going up. Okay, this is still increasing. You can never on this diagram have a line that goes down because okay, you can't undo radioactive decay. Um, just briefly, the neodymium isotope system works in a very, very similar way. So in this case, samarium-147 uh, something uh, decays to neodymium-143, used by an alpha decay this time. Okay, but it's, it works slightly a different way around in that when you melt the mantle, so with before the parent isotope rubidium was more incompatible. Okay, so if we look now, what happens when we melt the mantle? So this is the mantle down here with a chondritic kind of proportion of elements. So if we melt the mantle, if we do a small degree melt, then we kind of move up here somewhere into this region. So in this case, samarium is slightly more compatible than neodymium. So neodymium is enriched in the continental crust. Okay, and the, what's left behind uh, the kind of the residual mantle is down here. Okay, so we've now depleted the mantle in neodymium, kind of got more samarium in our mantle. Now, when we then melt the mantle again, so form a mid-ocean ridge basalt, something like that, that's quite a high degree melt. Okay, so you don't fractionate the elements as much with a high degree melt than with a small degree melt. You should have done that with Jeff. Uh, so you end up with a mid-ocean ridge, kind of still enriched in these trace elements. Okay, because both neodymium and strontium are incompatible, but because we've uh, we've just we've basically we've melted a large degree melt, the concentration of everything increases by basically the same amount. So what we're looking at now is the continental crust has got less samarium and more neodymium, whereas mid-ocean ridge basalts have got similar amounts of neodymium and samarium. Okay, so over time, on the next one. So over time, over time now, as we grow in. 143, 144. So this is so we've basically we've normalized the radiogenic isotope 143 neodymium to a stable isotope 144. So once again, okay, we start out at some initial value when the Earth is formed, and over time we increase the amount of radiogenic neodymium. Okay, but this time when we form continental crust, okay, we're removing samarium. We've got less samarium than we do neodymium, so it evolves at a slower rate along this line, whereas depleted mantle is up here. Okay, so that's, that's just a recap of how radiogenic isotopes work. Um, so now I just want to talk about something that's really important for geochemistry, and that is it really matters what you measure. Okay, so if we were to just uh, get some sediment out of the deep ocean, dissolve it all, measure it, we wouldn't really know what that was telling us about the environment in the past because the components of that sediment come from lots of different places. Okay, So if we wanted to know about the chemistry of the ocean, okay, we would have to isolate a component of the sediment that was formed in the ocean. Okay, So for instance, if we wanted to know about the oxygen isotope composition of the ocean, we might pick out planktonic forams okay, that grew in the ocean. Okay. We wouldn't pick out bits of quartz, which also have oxygen in, because they'd be telling us about the oxygen isotope composition of wherever that quartz formed, which would be on the land somewhere, presumably. Okay, so there are a whole bunch of ways that, that things that in our sediment can get kind of chemistry, get some goodies in it that we can measure. So things can, things can precipitate in seawater, so things with shells, okay, so they'll record the composition of the seawater in the part of the ocean that they formed. Okay, so you might want to be, if, for instance, with oxygen isotopes, the oxygen isotopes of the surface ocean and the deep ocean will be different. Okay, so if you wanted to measure those differences, you would measure something that grew in the surface ocean and something that grew in the deep ocean. Okay, there are other inputs of elements of the ocean, so terrigenous material, so dust, okay, gets put into the deep ocean. 
So if we wanted to learn about where that dust was from or how much of it was being inputted, we would try to measure some element okay, that was concentrated in dust but not concentrated in stuff that's in seawater. So something maybe like titanium, okay, refractory elements that are in continental material but don't dissolve in seawater, maybe thorium, things like that. Um, then you've got other things that basically uh, the coatings on things that are on the seafloor. Okay, so sometimes when something is sitting on the seafloor, it'll be coated by something, maybe an iron manganese oxide. And that iron manganese oxide will scavenge elements from seawater, and we'll see this later on, and record the composition of seawater at that site of scavenging. So it's really important to consider where the thing that you are measuring has got its elements. Okay, so just bear that in mind for the rest. Okay, so strontium isotopes. So uh, where, do, where does the ocean get its strontium? So there are, there are three uh, main, uh, main sources. So you can weather continental rocks. Okay, that puts strontium into river water. That enters the ocean. Okay, you can, you can uh, strontium can enter through hydrothermal activity with, with basically volcanic rocks, so mid-ocean ridges. Okay, so that brings in strontium to the oceans. And there's, a, there's a, a third term of diagenesis of sediments, and that brings a different kind of source of strontium into the ocean. We'll just look at those in turn. So, so this is kind of a diagenesis. So this is, uh, I think this is a coral. It's made of aragonite. It's got loads and loads of strontium in it because the crystal structure of aragonite allows it to incorporate strontium. Calcite, uh, much more common in the geological record. That's got a much lower concentration, concentration of strontium, as does dolomite. So if we take... An aragonitic coral, okay, and over time that might turn into calcite through diagenesis. All this strontium that was in the coral will be released into the poor water environment to ultimately go back into the ocean. Um, so just briefly, weathering. So we've just covered why the continental crust will have a high um, strontium isotope ratio. So, so on this side now we've got the strontium isotope. So this is backwards from the uh, ones we've seen before. Um, so co old continental rocks will have a very high strontium isotope ratio. Okay, younger continental rocks will have a lower strontium isotope ratio, and stuff that comes from like volcanic rocks that comes from the mantle will have a very low strontium isotope ratio. So, um, if you the weathering source is probably somewhere along this axis here, somewhere up here, kind of average river composition. Okay, and that inputs into the ocean strontium with an, a specific isotope ratio. Okay, and you can see down there there's the, um, I put on the, the average ratio is 0.7119, something like that. Um, and it's quite a large flux, 33 times 10 to the 9 moles per year, so that's gigamoles, which is a huge amount. Um, so you might want to think about how you might have get those numbers. If you, if, you were a, if you were a scientist and you wanted to know how much strontium was going into the ocean from rivers and what its isotope ratio was, how would you work out those two numbers? Okay, how would you go about measuring those? Come on, talk about that. And, um, so the hydrothermal source. So this is stuff that's coming basically from the mantle. Okay, the mantle will have a very low strontium isotope ratio because over time it's had a very low rubidium strontium ratio. Um, so you might have seen this diagram before in, I think, ELE or something like that. But this is basically just a cartoon of we have uh, seawater gets sucked in to hydrothermal systems um, at mid-ocean ridges because once the water is, poor water is basically in the rock, it heats up, expands and rises out the top. So you must be circulating water through the system. Um, so uh, strontium gets sucked into the system from, uh, from seawater. So the water as it goes into the system starts out with some strontium in it. Okay. And then it passes through the, uh, passes through the rocks, and those rocks have strontium in them that's basically from the mantle, so we'll have a very low strontium isotope composition. And if we just look at what's happening, so this is, these are measurements of water at hydrothermal vents, okay? So we're looking at basically the concentration of strontium along the x-axis, and then on the vertical axis, looking at the concentration of calcium and the concentration of chlorine. And because we've got this very, very kind of like tight correlation between the two, Okay, this, this tells us is that there's an exchange of strontium and calcium between seawater and rocks. Okay, 
So because the correlation is so good, this basically tells us that because calcium and strontium, we'd expect to behave quite similarly anyway, because they're very close to each other in the periodic table, in the same period, okay, just one above the other. So what's happening here is we're basically exchanging strontium from seawater with minerals in the, um, in the crust, I guess. Um, so minerals that contain calcium and strontium, and we're basically just swapping the strontium backwards and forwards. So when we look at what actually comes out of, the, uh, of these hydrothermal vents, the strontium isotope composition here is some intermediate between seawater and uh, the mantle source here. Okay, but you can see it is much lower than the seawater composition. It's much lower than the weathering flux, which was 0.7119 or something. Okay. So the last, uh, the last source is this flux from sediments. So this is a composite plot of uh, measurements from down deep drill cores into, into, the, into ocean sediments. Okay, so you can see here that they've, they've drilled down maybe 800 meters into the sediments, and they've measured the, the concentration, an isotopic composition of the pore water, so the water in between all the grains. And you can see here that there's a, the concentration increases with depth. Okay, so if you have a concentration gradient, that much means that there must be diffusion along that gradient. Okay, so stuff diffuses from high concentration to low concentration. So this concentration gradient is telling us that there must be a flux of strontium from the sediment into the seawater. Okay, so we we can we can actually by some diffusion modeling we can work out what that rate is. Okay, and we can extrapolate that over the whole ocean because sediment is pretty much the same everywhere in the deep ocean. And then if we look at what isotope ratio that sediment is, or that pore water is, we can see that all of the, so these are profiles of this, of the, the profiles of the um, strontium isotope composition. So seawater is up here, and as you go deeper and deeper into the sediment, as more and more stuff is being dissolved and being put into the pore water, we can see we get lower and lower strontium isotope values, 0.707. So this is a mixture of dissolution of calcium carbonate, which is from seawater, okay, which, so uh, the seawater composition of strontium is quite complicated, it changes through time, but it doesn't change by much. So uh, it's this, like modern seawater is up there. Um, this point down here is where seawater, the composition of seawater at the time the sediment was deposited. So because all of the pore water values are lower in their strontium isotope composition. That must mean we must be adding strontium from something that's not carbonate produced from seawater. And what that is, is basically small, very small amounts of volcanic ash that are in the sediment that dissolves and releases its strontium. And that has a very low strontium isotope composition. So just to summarize that, okay, we've got different inputs. We've got the river influx, the benthic flux, which is from sediments, and the hydrothermal influx. Okay, and we can, we can put numbers on those for what the strontium isotope ratio was, or is, from those. Okay? And for the river input and the benthic flux, we can kind of work out what the, the flux is. Okay? And the hydrothermal flux, we can also work that out because we know basically we've got six unknowns, well, one unknown, six. We've got enough knowns and unknowns to work out what it is, and we'll do that in a practical. Okay, so the way that we go about doing that is we can use this, this concept of mass balance. So this is very simply, I mean, it's very, it's very similar to, 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 um, to mixing paint. Uh, so if you imagine you had kind of white paint and, and black paint, and you mix those together, okay, the, the final color that your paint is, or the shade of gray it is, um, I'll resist. Um, the shade of grey that your 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 um, paint is is um, is a is a function of the proportions of the different amounts of paint you've had and like how black and how white the paint was. So in this case, we've got um, so for instance here we've got the strontium isotope composition of seawater is a function of the compositions of the river flux, the hydrothermal flux, and the benthic flux. Basically, each of those times by the relative importance of each of those fluxes. So these are the fractional fluxes. Okay, you can you convert those into um, real fluxes by dividing by the real fluxes at the bottom there, um, and we'll do that in the practical. Okay, so that yeah, that homework exercise will basically be practical. 
Um, now, the thing about strontium in the ocean is that we can, we can if we're going to measure the isotope composition of something somewhere in the ocean, we want to know, is that representative of the whole ocean, or is it just representative of that bit of the ocean that we've measured? So, for instance, with oxygen isotopes, each part of the ocean will have a subtly different oxygen isotope composition because the oxygen isotopes scale well with salinity, you should remember from the practical. Now, that means that if you measure the oxygen isotopes in one place, that's not necessarily representative of the whole ocean. Whereas with strontium, we can calculate the residence time from the data here. So we know how much strontium there is in the ocean by working out basically the size of the ocean and measuring the concentration. Okay, and we can work out what the flux is. Okay, so what the, the, the rate of input is. And from that, you can work out the residence time, which you should have done in previous courses. But basically, the residence time of strontium is two and a half million years. Okay, so that means that if you change the fluxes, if you halve the flux, it would take two and a half million years for the concentration to change by, by half. Okay, so the concentration changes very slowly in the ocean. Okay, and you can see the mixing time of the ocean is very short, of the order of a thousand years. So that means that because the residence time is much longer than the mixing time. Everywhere in the ocean has the same strontium isotope composition. Okay, so and that, I mean, also means that the, the concentration is basically only varies with salinity. Okay, so that this is this is quite quite neat because this this means that we can measure the strontium isotope composition in one place in the ocean, and that will tell us about the strontium isotope composition everywhere in the ocean. Okay. So this is uh, some, these are, sorry, these are some data, it's a bit old now, it's like 25 years old, um, of strontium isotope measurements of something that represents the ocean. So I think these were uh, measured on uh, foraminifera. Okay, so they precipitate in the ocean, so they've taken strontium from the ocean, and we can then kind of infer that this is the, the strontium isotope composition of the ocean. So we can see here that this is the, ooh, this here is the, um, the composition of the ocean now and back through time it changed okay okay but it's changing quite slowly so we've got a scale here of many eight million years something like that okay um and you can see so the river influx is 0.719 so that's way off the scale at the top here hydrothermal flux 0 0.735 that's way off the scale down the bottom okay so we're actually changing the isotopic composition by actually relatively small amounts relative to the compositions of the fluxes. Okay. So some questions you might want to ask yourself is what kind of things were we measuring and what, what do we need to avoid when we're measuring the things? So I've said these are measured on 4 amps, but would that be an appropriate thing to measure back through all of geological time? Anybody into paleontology? Okay, so forums haven't been around that long, so it's not, you can't measure from the whole geological time. Okay, so what's driving these changes? Okay, so we, we know that at the current fluxes and isotope compositions that are going in from rivers and hydrothermal and the benthic fluxes. Um, so it's, it's, it's very unlikely that the benthic flux will change, okay, because that's, that's basically the bottom of the ocean and conditions at the bottom of the ocean are fairly stable. Um, but we can change the composition of the ocean by changing either the magnitude of the flux. So if we start adding more riverine strontium in, that should make the isotope ratio go higher. Yeah, because that's got a, a more radiogenic, uh, so a higher strontium 87-86 ratio. Or if we increase the hydrothermal flux, if you made mid-ocean ridges hotter and, and spread more fast, that would bring more strontium in with a low strontium isotope composition. So we could change the fluxes, or, okay, or we could actually change the composition of the end members. So if, if rivers started having a different flux, if we started weathering older rocks or younger rocks, that might change the end member composition. So that would change the, um, the strontium isotopes through time. So just an uh, uh, example, this is the, these, are, these, are, these are model examples of, of what that happens. So I've simplified the strontium isotope curve to this, this um, green line along the top. And then the next figures are basically what you would have to do to reconstruct that green line. Okay, so the, the first, the middle panel there is just changing the flux. So 
if you kept everything else the same and just changed the river flux, that top line, which shows that to get the increases that where the strontium isotope ratio of the ocean increases, you'd have to have a, a higher river flux. Okay? Or you could have reduced the hydrothermal flux. Or you could change the, the composition of the fluxes, and that's what the bottom figure is doing. And on the bottom figure, you can see the composition of seawater is basically this, so that green line is the same green line as on the top figure. Okay, so you can see that the relative scales are very, very different. So the end, comp the, the changing the uh, isotope ratio of seawater is actually quite sensitive to changing the composition of the end members because they're so different. Okay, I just thought I'd put this, this, this in to give you a little um, a word of caution when interpreting data. So, uh, so the, these coloured lines weren't in the original paper, so I've just copied the same figure one top of the other, and I've just put through different ways of interpreting that data, or those data, sorry. So it's the same, so you could say that actually during this period here, there's nothing really happening at all. You could draw a straight line through all of those error bars on those data there, nothing happens. Okay, then there's a constant rate of increase. Whereas if you kind of wanted to interpret every little wiggle and jiggle in your data, you could actually say, oh, well, there's, a, there's an anomaly here. That might be a little pulse of weathering or a, a change in source of weathering in there. And then you have a gradual increase, but there's also these short little pulses of change here. So just, just uh, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that with quite a lot of geoscience data is it can be quite subjective what you actually interpret from kind of a cloud of data points. Um, okay, so we're going to actually come and use this now and see what, what we can do with it. So this is, uh, so I've basically now expanded the, the age scale and now we're looking across the whole of the Phanerozoic and we can see here how the strontium isotope composition of the ocean has changed through time. Okay, um, you can see that the, the scatter of the data gets bigger as we move back in time. Okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at why that might be and what we can do about that. Um, okay, so we can we start thinking, if we, if we measure the strontium isotope composition of something that we find in some sediment, okay, and we know we had these data beforehand, we know that these, uh, uh, the age of that sample must be either at this point, somewhere over here, somewhere over here, somewhere over here, to here or here or here, okay? So we can use it to to basically try and narrow down how old we think something is. So we, we, if, we, if we knew that our sediment was you know, from the tertiary, then we could know exactly how old it is in this glass and we could ignore those older bits of the curves. But it does get a little bit more intelligent than that. So, so from this size, if we know that it's kind of actually from the um, Paleozoic, um, we say, well, it's, it's one of those dates. Okay, not much use. But if we then look at our, um, where our sample is, stratigraphically, so we say we've, de we've measured it from, from there, and then we measure some other samples above and below, we know that the green one must be younger than the blue one, which must be younger than the red one, okay? Because they're one on top of the other, that's how geology works. Okay, so those are the ages now, well, those are the strontium isotopes, say, we, we measured. Okay, so we know now that, say, for instance, those are now the only two ages that that, sediment, that can be, because those are the only points where the, um, the thing is increasing, okay, in age. Okay, so we can, we can start to use it as a chronological tool. Um, but when we do that, we need to worry about some of this scatter, okay? And we want, ideally, because we know that the residence time of strontium is quite long, okay? That means that at any one time, all of the ocean must have the same strontium isotope composition. Okay, so this, this scatter here, okay, cannot be real. Okay, this must represent some error in either our measurement or bias in sampling. Okay, because seawater at any one time can only be one value. Okay, so you can take all kinds of approaches to this kind of thing. So you can, this thing, some people like to kind of like group their data together into little boxes and then kind of work out what the, the spread is and use that as a kind of like a smooth curve. So this, this line going through here is not, it basically is an overestimate of your confidence in 
what the actual value of the ocean is. Some places there's, there are big errors. Okay, so maybe something more appropriate might be something like this, where you actually get some realistic estimate of the, the uncertainty. So for instance here, this point here, there's only one point that they've measured, and they've said on this one, well, that gives us really small error, okay, which is obviously a ludicrous statement. Okay, whereas over this approach here, where there is very little data, they tend to have quite large uncertainties, which is more appropriate. So you've got to think quite carefully about how you smooth your data between points. Um, and just a little thing about sample selection. So again, these data in the middle here, uh, we know that they're all the same age. Okay, we might even say that they were all sampled from the same bed in a, in a geological formation. So they must be the same age. And we know that they cannot all have different strontium isotope ratios because the mixing time of the ocean is too short relative to the, the residence time of strontium. So that means that there must be something going wrong here. Okay? Um, so what these people have done is they've basically they've divided their samples into good samples and bad samples. Okay? The good samples are the one with the solid little circles. The bad samples are the ones with the, the open circles. And they've just used the good samples to, um, to, to figure out what the seawater was over time. And that's given a, a fairly good result. Now, they haven't just chosen that. You know, all the, oh, I quite like these ones, and I don't like these ones for no reason. So they've actually, uh, that curve is based on brachiopod measurements. This is a picture of a brachiopod. Um, and different types of brachiopod have subtly different uh, structures of the calcite that makes up their shells. And in this case, there's this thing called punctuate, impunctuate, which is basically, does the shell have these little holes running through it? Okay. Now, this is an SEM picture of uh, a fossil brachiopod. And here's one of those holes. And you can see that it's been infilled with blocky, a blocky mineral. Okay, so that should be a hole, and it's now got something in it that is not a hole. So since this thing was living, okay, um, it's died, and as, as it's been turned into a fossil, some calcite has been added to it. Okay, that calcite will have a strontium isotope composition that is not of the composition of the seawater from which it was precipitated. Okay, which means that if you measured all of this thing, then you would get the wrong number okay so what the what these guys have done is they've basically they've selected only these kind of brachiopods that don't have holes in okay so they're less susceptible to this kind of alteration okay so that's important as well so you need to make sure that your sample really is you know a nice pristine kind of representation of the past ocean before you make an interpretation that it is okay so to summarize um, the strontium isotopes in the ocean, and this will form part of the practicalist world. So, very slow changes. Uh, you can go through the reasons why strontium isotopes is, is higher in old continental rocks and is lower in, in volcanic sources. Um, and the strontium isotope composition of seawater is, a, is basically a balance between the weathering flux and the hydrothermal flux. So, we can use the strontium isotope curve to reconstruct how much weathering there was in the past versus how much kind of volcanism there was in the past, which is really important because volcanism adds CO2 to the environment, whereas weathering removes CO2 from the environment. So the strontium isotope curve through time is an important part of understanding the past carbon cycle. Okay, And there's a bunch of reading, and there's, in fact, I've put on Learn, uh, there's two papers, one by uh, uh, Peter Molnar and Philip England, and another paper by uh, Maureen Ramo and Bill Ruddyman. And they go through kind of the arguments about how strontium isotopes are used uh, to reconstruct um, uh, what are the drivers for climate change. So what causes CO2 to change over long geological timescales. And those two papers are really, really quite excellent. They're written by some of the, like, the biggest cheeses in geoscience. They have thousands of citations each. Um, for the, just for those papers, I mean, they've got hundreds of thousands of citations for all of the scientists. But anyway, so I recommend that if you're going to read any of the additional reading that I've put online, read those two papers. So neodymium isotopes, similar to uh, strontium, work the other way around. Um, so this this uh, this equation here is very similar to the the delta equation for oxygen isotopes. Okay, we've got the sample. Okay, this is some standard that represents basically what the um, the average, um, like the bulk Earth is at the moment, uh, and this is basically changes by parts in per ten thousand. So small variations, okay. 
and they're driven by um, well, you can go back to the beginning of the lecture and, and find out what causes those changes. Um, but the important thing is neodymium has a much shorter residence time than strontium. Okay? So the residence time of neodymium in the ocean is of the order of maybe hundreds of years. So we do see variations in the isotopic composition in the ocean. Okay, so this is basically uh, some measurements of the composition of the sources. So the neodymium in the ocean ultimately comes from weathering from the land, very similar to strontium. Uh, but different parts of the land have got different neodymium isotope compositions. Okay, so old bits of the land will have had less, will have, old bits of the land will have less uh, samarium than neodymium, because the samarium is basically hidden away in the mantle. So they will have, uh, so places like Greenland and Canada, Africa, very low neodymium isotope ratios because the strontium is basically sequestered in the mantle. Whereas younger rocks, okay, they, uh, they have had chance, but before they were formed, the samarium in the mantle could grow into neodymium, and then when they were formed, that neodymium would have then a slightly higher 143, 144 ratio. But basically, you know, old rocks, low numbers, young rocks, like high numbers. Okay, volcanic rocks, low numbers. Um, so we're going to see how neodymium isotopes can be used to trace water masses as they move throughout the ocean. So uh, hopefully you will be familiar with kind of the top two diagrams. This is kind of like the schematic ocean conveyor of how kind of deep currents move around the earth. Um, so in, for instance, here, this is across, so basically this, this yellow line is this yellow line up here. So we're looking at a section through the ocean. Um, so in the North Atlantic here, deep water sinks, okay, then flows up and upwells in the Southern Ocean, where it then forms something called Antarctic Intermediate Water and Antarctic Bottom Water, which fill kind of the oceans flowing back to the North. So if we want to figure out where those water masses are now, that's very easy. We can just measure the temperature and salinity of the water, and that tells us kind of pretty much where that water came from, and we can kind of, kind of label the water masses. But in the past, okay, it's very, very hard to measure the temperature and salinity of seawater from the past, okay, because we don't have the water. Okay, we can measure proxies for it. Um, but one of the things we can do is we can see if we could, there is some other basically geochemical label that's basically attached to the water masses, okay, and then gets preserved in sediments. Okay, so this uh, this bottom thing is basically describing what would make a good, um, what would make a good proxy for that. So we want something that basically doesn't get changed, so it won't change its the the, the composition of the the water mass tracer when it's in the water mass. It will only be affected when that water mass touches basically the edges of the ocean. So its composition is set at the boundaries but not changed in the interior. And also, it doesn't, uh, it's not affected by biogeochemical cycles, okay? Because that would change the composition of the tracer as it was moving along in the same water mass. And that would mean we couldn't use it to trace the water mass. Um, so neodymium is quite good for this because it's not part of the biological cycle at all, okay? And it is only really set by exchange with the boundaries. Okay, so where the water meets the edge of the ocean, either at the surface, the addition of dust, or the, the interaction with sediments, that can change its neodymium isotope composition. But when it's in the interior of the ocean, it can't really change much at all. Okay, so this is, this is, a, this is that same section. So we can see here, this is the, I think this is the salinity. So we can see here the salinity quite nicely. This green tongue picks out, or for you, green tongue, uh, the green tongue picks out the um, North Atlantic deep water forming in the, in the high North Atlantic. And then the blue water masses, the ones with lower salinities, are those Antarctic intermediate and Antarctic bottom water. So we can use salinity to pick out the water masses in the modern. Okay, and those are those water masses. Oh, that was fancy. Um, and there, there are more, uh, but you, there are lots and lots of different kinds of water. Um, but if we now look at measurements of neodymium isotopes, so the background colour on this is still the modern ocean salinity, and the, the profiles are 
the, uh, our measurements of neodymium isotopes. So it's all hardest to measure neodymium, so there are many, many fewer measurements. But we can see here, so the, 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 the pink line in each of these graphs is kind of, I think it's, it's 13, minus 13.5 epsilon value. So you can see in the North Atlantic, we've got uh, something that's close to minus 13. Then as we move down through the, uh, the ocean, here, so that the, the core of North Atlantic deep water basically maintains that same value, okay? But the uh, uh, and that Antarctic intermediate water coming in here, that has got a higher neodymium isotope ratio. So that means a less radiogenic, okay, source, which is similar to the, the rocks around the Southern Ocean, similar to the, the, the deep water down here. So that's got um, uh, a more positive, less radiogenic, uh, near DMU isotope composition here. So we can use then the near DMU isotopes, in this case, to identify the water masses. Now, if we're going to use this to go into the past, we can't measure the near DMU isotope composition of the water because the water isn't there anymore. Okay, so what we have to use is something that has basically captured the near dimium, near dimium from the water and preserved it in sediment. Okay? But we don't want kind of the whole water column composition. We just want to know what it is at each level in the water. Okay, so we want to know what the neodymium concentration was here, was here, was here, through back through time. Okay, so we want something that's grabbed neodymium from say this level in the ocean and preserved it in sediments. Okay, so if we just wanted to know the surface, we could you know measure some planktonic foraminifera. Okay. But if we want to know throughout the whole water column, what we have to do is get rid of that arrow. So we have to go somewhere in the ocean where the seafloor rises up throughout the water column so it provides places where the seabed can basically sample different uh, elevations in the water column. So we would have maybe uh, a seamount coming up uh, through the different kind of layers in the ocean, or you might have a, a continental slope which would provide uh, seafloor at different levels in the ocean. And then at each one of these levels, there'll be some kind of hopefully thing in the sediment that can grab the rare earth elements and maybe near dimium from the water into the sediment. And that could be a, a, an iron manganese oxide coating on um, sediment grains or something like a coral. Um, and if we sample um, these sediments or these corals at different depths within the ocean, we can we can measure um, the isotopic composition of those coatings, and that will tell us about the water column isotopic composition at discrete depths going up through the water column. Okay, so if we want to reconstruct this variability, we need a sample set that is able to reflect that variability. So you can't re reconstruct the whole water column from a single sediment sample. Okay, you need multiple samples for that, okay? Um, uh, yeah. So this is, uh, this is our head of department uh, who was on a research cruise with me ages ago now. And these are corals. And those corals were living on the seafloor. And you can see that some of the corals are white. Okay, and that is the colour that the coral should be. Okay, and then some of them are quite dark colours. Okay, so there's some blacks, there's some reds. And what those are is those are iron manganese coatings that are formed on those corals once they've died. And those coatings are basically scavenging rare earth elements from seawater. So if we basically collected samples like this from a depth profile throughout the ocean, at each level, we'd be able to record the neodymium isotope com concentration and composition from from the from the seawater. Okay, so this I mean this is this is on the on the left there. That's what they look like when they're living, and on the right here, you can see that they've got these these dark coatings on them, which has enabled us to basically extract neodymium from the seawater. Now, you don't have to get corals; they can be anything that's precipitated from seawater. So some uh, you on, on if you can even just sediment grains develop these iron manganese coatings so if you can isolate the iron manganese coating from the rest of the sediment then you can use that to reconstruct the isotopic composition of seawater 
So just some examples of that. So this is from the North Atlantic. Um, so before we kind of like move on and, and, and use these records down core, we basically need to make sure that our proxy works. So what we've got on the left here is basically an experiment to test whether we can extract the, the right isotope ratio from sediment. So these are uh, planktic foraminifera that lived in the surface ocean, okay, and they've sunk down to the bottom of the ocean and they've died. And once they're sitting on the seafloor, they, they've got these iron coatings on them, okay? So what's, what's happening here, and those coatings have got are uh, basically enriched in neodymium. The coatings basically uh, are good at, at grabbing rare earth elements from seawater, whereas uh, the, the, the foram calcite has got a much lower concentration of neodymium. So what they've done is they've, they've measured the composition of the water at the, at the core site, at the bottom and at the surface, and you can see that they're different ratios here. Okay, minus 14 and, and minus 10. And then they've taken the forams Okay, and they, this was just measured the foram, okay, and then they've cleaned it a bit to try and remove that iron coating, and they've measured what's left. Okay, and then as they do that, they carry on cleaning it, it gets less and less neodymium concentration as you keep on removing that coating, okay, until you remove the coating completely, and then you start to change the isotope composition as you start to have a significant component of the original calcite. So this basically shows them how much they need to clean their forams to make sure that they're clean and don't have any stuff that's maybe clays or something that might have a different isotope composition, but has not changed the isotope composition beyond what, like outside of the, the range that represents the seawater value. So that's what they've done. Uh, down core as well. So if you just look at, so this is a, a bunch of measurements in the sediment core. It doesn't really matter what's going on at the top up here. But down here, this is age. And just look at the, um, the black curve here. So these are neodymium isotope compositions of uh, two different things that have um, uh, uh, basically been sat on the seafloor and grabbing neodymium. So one is these forams that fell down to the bottom and they've got these coatings on. And the other is fish teeth. So it turns out that fish teeth, or in fact any kind of teeth, uh, when, they, when they sink to the ocean floor, they basically start with no rare earths in them, no neodymium, and then they basically start to absorb rare earth elements really, really quickly. Um, that's quite a good question, um, but I don't think anybody knows the answer. Um, it's, I think it's a, it's a property of the, the hydroxy appetite structure. Uh, and that subtly changes, so it's basically got, uh, it's got, rather than just being appetite, it's got small amounts of calcite in it as well, and that basically, it creates quite a porous kind of network of, of mineral, and because it's got lots of edges of mineral, that's got basically a high um, affinity for stuff. Um, uh, so it happens with bones as well. So if you, if you go and measure, say, bones from some archaeological site, you'll find they've got huge concentrations of trace metals. Um, and that's just because they've absorbed them from the environment around them. Um, so would, like, calcite always have more? So pure calcite would have less. So it's not, it's not that it's got some calcite in it. It's basically that it's got lots of holes in it where the calcite is. Um, so it's, it's basically, it's like a, it's got mineral, it's, mineralogically, it's a bit like a sponge. But uh, what well, back to basically they've measured the the black uh, triangles and the red triangles are the same sample of sediment and they've measured the fish teeth and they've measured the forams and they've got the same number. Okay, measured two different things, got the same number. That gives you some confidence that you're getting the right number. Um, so just to just to put this these kind of data in context, so the top gives some. Uh, some kind of background to this, what's going on climatically in this kind of time frame. So we've got um, at the top here, the black is the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. So this is increasing across the deglaciation. Sea level going up quite dramatically across the deglaciation. Uh, changes in Antarctic temperature that are quite different to the changes in the temperature in Greenland. Uh, and then here, down here, we've basically got, uh, I think on the next slide, 
Okay, so if we, we then zoom into to this, this bottom slide here, we've got um, the neodymium isotope composition. Okay, so this is uh, the scale. Paleoceanographers really love to screw with your mind and flipping scales around all over the shop. So uh, we've got uh, unradiogenic. So for neodymium, that means the old rock source up and the young rock source down. So more radiogenic down here. Uh, so in the Holocene, we've got a fairly, you know, uniform-ish uh, signal that basically looks like it's getting its neodymium from the North Atlantic, from all those old rocks around Greenland. Okay, but then back in the glacial times, last glacial maximum, you can see the neodymium isotope composition is much lower, sorry, much higher on this uh, this flipped axis. So it looks like it's getting its uh, neodymium from somewhere else that's got much more volcanic rocks okay and then you have these little ups and downs during the deglaciation okay so if we look at just a map of sediment isotopic composition now we can see that this kind of maps out uh so we've got these uh these very low very unradiogenic neodymium isotopes up here in the north atlantic and you see that the pattern kind of follows the flow of deep water. Okay, so for now that we've got another sediment core down here in the South Atlantic, um, and this red curve is the one you want to be focusing in on. So once again, we've got here the neodymium isotopes. Once again, the scale is flipped because you know we like to do that to you, and we've got more negative, more North Atlantic type compositions up here in the Holocene, more kind of southern ocean, more kind of uh, less, sorry, more radiogenic neodymium isotopes down here in the glacial period. So we can now start to use these to kind of reconstruct how we think the ocean circulation was in the past. So the top figure is here, this is that Holocene configuration where we've got North Atlantic deep water flavoured neodymium in our northern core site and kind of similarly North Atlantic deep water flavoured uh, water in the um, in the southern ocean, well, in the, in, uh, where we've got our core site. Okay, so the core is basically floating up in this section because it's sitting on a uh, it's sitting on the continental margin, so it's higher up in the ocean. So it's sampling this shallower water than being at the bottom. Um, but in the last glacial maximum, both of the core sites have uh, a neodymium isotopic composition that represents more of the southern source, more of the the uh, radiogenic. Uh, kind of neodymium isotopes that are from uh, rocks around the, the Southern Ocean. Okay, so that, that kind of summarizes what I've just said. Um, and this is kind of important because we can now have, a, we basically now have a record of uh, how oceans, the ocean was circulating, okay? This, basically the, 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 the relative strengths of deep water formation in the Northern Hemisphere versus deep water formation in the Southern Hemisphere. So in uh, the Holocene, we've got more deep water being forced, formed in the Northern Hemisphere, coming down into as far as the Southern Ocean, whereas in the glacial maximum down here, we've got that North Atlantic deep water signal is much, much less strong, and we've got water filling the whole Atlantic from the south. Okay? And you can see the impact of that on the temperature of Greenland. Okay, so you can see that these changes in how the ocean is circulating are really tightly coupled with how uh, the Earth's climate is. So this is north, basically northern hemisphere temperature. So these dramatic swings that we get in northern hemisphere temperature are closely linked to how, how the ocean is circulating. Now, with these data, we, we're as yet unable to say which is the cart and which is the horse, so which is, which is driving... What? So is it the temperature changes that are changing ocean circulation, or is it ocean circulation changes that are driving temperature change? Okay, It's likely not as simple as that either or. They're probably tightly coupled, but just to point out that we can actually now use our radiogenic isotope knowledge to tell us something actually quite useful and interesting about paleoclimate. Okay? So if those of you that sat for all of Jeff's lectures and wondering where the hell it was going, why we're doing it, that's what we did. Okay, so near Dimium was a water mass tracer. Um, so, if you learn how strontium works, okay, just remember that neodymium is the other way around, <laughs> in terms of what higher, lower, and the old versus young rocks. Um, 
Uh, oh, you can read through the um, things. But I just wanted to point out that it's really important to get a good uh, understanding of what it is that should be measured to reconstruct what you want to know. Okay? So you really need to know your samples very well. Okay? So what is it that that sample, how did you, your sample get its um, elements that you're interested in? Okay? So was it from when it initially formed its shell, or was it from when that shell was on the seafloor and scavenged elements? Okay? Are we looking at, is this a flux of dust into our sediment, or is this kind of just... Or, you know, also think about the um, residence times of the elements in the ocean. So if it's got a long residence time, you can say that that's representative of the whole ocean. If it's got a short residence time, it's only telling you about a local bit of the ocean. That's not necessarily bad, because that might enable you to make more measurements to learn something more detailed about the structure of the ocean in the past. But you do need to bear in mind that you know, there are differences in the way different isotope systems work. 